tonight we're going to give our last part on the deity of Christ. Now we have been on a Bible study on the person of Jesus Christ and under the person of Jesus Christ we have taught so far about his humanity and then tonight we will finish concerning his godliness, his divineness or modern term his deity and we are not going to cover the divine attributes of Christ under this study and the reason why we're not is because immediately after this study we're going to be studying the attributes of God and uh, if you've got anything out of my study would you assume that the attributes of God coincide with the attributes of Christ Sure they do. Sure, I've been teaching that Jesus Christ is God. He's God in the Son. And so if we teach on the attributes of God, if I teach on Christ now, I won't have anything to teach about when I get to the attributes of God because they're the same. Okay? They're the same. So we are going to wait because we want to give an extensive study and use our overhead projector. We have some special, special uh, transparencies that we have uh, received. I picked them up when I was at the district council on this study of the attributes of God, and I believe it's going to be a good study, and we want to really get into it in what God's attributes consist of. And I'm sure that you've been through it many times, maybe in, in Sunday school, but this is going to be an in-depth study on each attribute. Amen. So tonight we're going to finish this study uh, under the attributes of Christ, under the deity of Christ. We have covered his divine names, and that's important because you were named. You may not think it, but most people have been named for a reason. You received your name for a reason. Somebody just to say, oh, I wonder, I can't find a name, I'll call him Toad. You know, uh, uh, we just don't do things like that. You know, uh, uh, people don't do things like that. Not people that take pride in their names. They, they, they pick a name that will mean something. Uh, either it will go along with an ancestor, uh, maybe an uncle or an aunt or a grandfather uh, or grandmother, whichever. Surely if it's a girl, it will go on the side of the grandmother and mother and all that. And, but these names keep up a line of importance in a family tree. My sons, each of them have the middle name of, one of them has the middle name, at least the middle name of my wife's father, his first name. My other son has the, his middle name is the same as the first name of my father. So that we, we keep that family tree Revelant in name. Now, it may not seem important to you, but to us it is. Because every time we look at our sons, we're reminded of our fathers. And that's important. Names given to Jesus Christ are important because they bring him into revelance with his father. They make him relevant to the triune God. They keep him in accordance with the line of David, which is a bloodline that is a pure line. And each name that we have went over with you have brought out different types of meanings showing the character of of Jesus Christ. All right. And then we went into, in our second study, under his deity, it is important that we show him divine worship. And we had, I, I enjoyed the two studies that we had under divine worship. And the Lord moved so wonderfully under one of those nights. And I thank the Lord for that. Because he indicated that he was pleased with, I believe, our study in trying to show you the importance of worshiping Jesus because you love him, because you respect him, 
as God. He's not just a name floating around. Angels shouted. He's not just a man to walk the roads of Galilee. But he is God. Hallelujah. He's worthy of all of our worship and all of our praise. And then last, last week we gave you a study on the qualities and properties of Jesus Christ. His pre-existence, His self-existence, His immutability, and His fullness in the Godhead. Uh, how that He fulfills the Godhead. And this is where is a touchy subject. We won't get into it tonight, but we have different doctrines that go one way or the other. Some doctrines don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Other doctrines don't believe in, in the personality of God the Father or the Holy Spirit. They believe that everything is just Jesus Christ. But the Word of God brings out the triune God. 1 John. Read 1 John. And it will bring it out word for word. Tonight, we finish this study on the divine offices which have been ascribed to Christ. The divine offices. Now, first of all, the word divine means godly. It means God. It, it attributes to God. Secondly, the word office could be sort of pointed toward the meaning appointment, to be appointed to a certain specific job. Tonight we're going to share with you some of the jobs that Christ has been appointed to do. And you say, Pastor, was he appointed? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. He says it right in the Word that God the Father gave him the authority to do these jobs. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me tonight to 1 John chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. It's good to have all of you here. Praise the Lord. Next Wednesday night, let's fill the gaps. Are you all asleep? Good. Everybody's got a scripture to read. If you don't mind leaving your loved one, please come to the front and sit in the front so we can get these scriptures read fluently. Well, I've learned to love Jesus more through studying this. And he means more to me. He's more of a personal God to me than ever before. When I walk around and I pray, I don't pray to a cloud anymore. You know, there's times, you know, uh, when I've been out this evening, I, I was jogging up in the cemetery about after four o'clock, and that sky, the, the longer the evening went, the clearer and sharper that sky got. I mean, the blue was so deep, it was almost ultraviolet. And I was just, uh, you know, around the, around the graves and and I have at times been praying and I would look at a cloud and pray. I was praying to the Lord, but I was seeing the cloud. But I'll tell you, this study's done something for me and today there was no clouds to see and it was just perfectly clear. And I just asked the Lord, Lord, give me a vision of your loveliness. Give me a vision of your holiness. Help me to know you as a personal Christ. Let me have a relationship with you like I have with other brethren. Let me be able to touch you spiritually. Let me be able to talk with you spiritually and hear you talk back. Maybe not audibly, but may my heart react. Feel the touch of God. Know that He's near. Sunday night, somebody told me, said, My I was hot. And I said, well, it, he wasn't that hot in it. That wasn't the kind of heat, Pastor. My body was hot. God was all over me. I said, good. Good. Praise the Lord. I, one of these days, you know, we'll, get, we'll have so much power in these services, none of us will think about being chilled. Get that blood moving. Every Saturday night I jog if it's clear. 
You say, why do you do it, Pastor? Because I want my mind to be clear on Sunday morning. If you want to be clear in church, you do something before you come to church. And get your mind working. Get the blood up in there. It, that's the truth. You get that brain working. And it'll make you alert to the point that you'll take in more. And every Saturday night, if I can possibly do it, I do six miles. And make sure my brain's been flooded with that red stuff. Make my heart beat as hard as it'll beat. And then I come to my office, straight from the run, and I study. And brother, my mind's clear, sharp, and I can get into the Word and I can remember. And when I get up on Sunday morning, that message is still drilled deep in my mind, deep in my heart. Now, that's just a, a physical thing. But I believe that the power of God can generate our spiritual mind, our heart, and get our spiritual adrenaline to the point that it quickens every part of this body, every part of this soul, until God's Word becomes so alive in our hearts that we feel every move of God in this place. Every time He moves, we become so sensitive that we feel. Buddy, that's my desire to see that. Sunday night, we had a pretty good touch of it. Can you say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Let's begin reading. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth Him, that begat, loveth Him also that is begotten of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God. Don't forget that. How do we know we love our brother? When we find out finally that we love God. You can't love your brother until you first love God. Ain't no way. Brother, fleshly love. I've seen it happen too many times. Husbands want to want to get the love of their wives and they'll buy them everything. All kinds of expensive stuff. And you once you start that. You never get done. Now, I mean that. I mean that. And girls don't get mad, but you know, the more you get, the more you want. And it still doesn't satisfy. Because after a while, it starts getting old. But I'll tell you something. Real love, I'm talking about marriage love, comes from God. I really believe that. That's why Christian marriages are so unique. Real, I mean, I mean marriages that are involved with revival. How long has it been since you had a revival on your knees before you went to bed? As a husband and wife, praying in the Spirit, getting a hold of God. Boy, that makes a good marriage. That makes a good marriage. My wife, she wants to go to sleep too quick, but I... Uh, I have to shake her from time to time. Come on, keep praying. She's not here tonight, so I can really talk about her. Verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And if you will check back to the original Greek and Latin, you'll find that they have derived from these interpretations that water is immediately uh, meaning here uh, the cleansing of the word so that it goes right back to John 1.1 1, 1. God, Jesus Christ he is the word in the beginning was the word so water is interpreted the cleansing of the word and so you see that it's important that the blood cleanses but it's the blood of the word of God Jesus Christ. Do you got that? Is that too deep? It's the blood of the Word of God, Jesus Christ.
Everybody with me? People are looking at me. Their eyes are big. Maybe you're just wanting more. I hope that's what it is and that you're not... This is he that came by water. Yes, in verse 7, there are three that bear record in heaven. Listen to this. Talk about the triune God. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. triune God. And there are three that bear witness in earth. The spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, well, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave us of his Son. This is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. Heavenly Father, bless your word tonight. Help us as we quickly try to go through this last portion, that, Lord, you will make it real to our hearts, and may we learn more about the availability, the power and the demonstration of Jesus Christ through the Holy Ghost in our lives today. And may we never be afraid to exercise our faith in reaching out to a Christ who is able to do the impossible. In Jesus' name, amen. First of all, tonight under divine offices, the Bible brings out that he is. He just not was. He just wasn't. I'm, I'm all out of he just was, uh, we say he was the creator. It's more than that. He still is the creator. He just didn't create the world. He just did not create Adam and Eve. But I believe that every genetic creation, I believe that every live baby that is born of a woman is an act and a miracle of God. You say, what's the difference? Dogs have little puppies. Horses have colts or mares. What's the difference? Cows have calves. You know what the difference is? Every time that baby, that baby begins to have life. There is the beginning of an, the imputation of a soul. A horse doesn't have a soul. A cow doesn't have a soul. When they die, they don't have to pay the penalty for anything because they were made for man's enjoyment. They were made that we might eat them. So you ladies, don't you get mad when I shoot them deer because they're made to eat. But man was not made to eat. He was made for God's enjoyment. Listen to me. The animal is man's enjoyment. Man is God's enjoyment. And there is a spiritual imputation there. God imputes part of himself. You say, how is it, Pastor? Let me tell you, my Bible tells me when God created man, he breathed the very breath of life into his being. And he became a living soul, a very part of the living ability of God was imputed in me and made me for a tongue. How many believes that tonight? 
I'm not trying to get in some deep stuff here. I'm, I believe this is the way God works. We're serving a God who's able. He's able. I heard one lady one time, it's been several years ago, not here, or I wouldn't be saying it. But this lady said, boy, that one was a mistake. She was talking about her last kid, her last child. Mm. Pardon me. I had a little too much of Pizza Hut. And she referred to as a mistake. Hey, that's why I could preach a whole sermon one of these times I'm going to on abortion. Because there's no creation of God a mistake. You say, Pastor, what about the, the twisted, mangled, deformed hunks of flesh that are being born today? God didn't make them that way. Man's sin and corruption made them that way. Man has distorted God's creation. Are you with me tonight? John 1, 3. Thank you, Sister Sharon. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Yes, all things. Thank you, Sister. All things were made by him. And without him, th without him nothing was made. Absolutely nothing. Colossians 1.16, and I, I want you to begin, my brother, even though your little piece of paper says 1.16, I want you to read verses 15 through 18. Read them slow and rather distinct, my brother. Ready? Okay. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Yes. For by him all things were created, that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Mm -hmm. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, which is beginning, mm. the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Hallelujah. He's to be number one. How many believes that? <laughs> He's to have the first place preeminence of all the creation. The cry of Almighty God is, I am still God. <laughs> the Creator. If it were not for me, and He says it, if you will, He says it with authority. And he says it with righteous selfishness. I am the creator and I am it. Hebrews 1.10. Thank you, sister. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Yes, amen. It goes in, thank you, it goes into the entirety. We could give you scripture. We just don't have time in these studies. But we could take you through the Bible. And sometime when you, you people have time, if you have concordances, take time to go through them. Look up creation and just see how many scriptures that there are that depict the creation and different parts of the creation because it's all the handiwork of God. Walk out here and look tonight. I mean positively beautiful. Uh, what else? could create it. Who else? I read the paper today. They found some bones out in Colorado or someplace that they say date back to about, what, 50, 70 million years? 50 million, uh, give or take a few million. But they say that, uh, you know, uh, they, they are showing that evolution, and they begin to talk about evolution. Uh, that they think there's two sides to evolution and all my heart began to beat. I thought, oh my, are they going to admit there could have been a creation? And uh, no, 
they, they're decided now that instead of being a slow evolution, it's possible there, there can be such a thing as a quick evolution. All of a sudden, a, a tremendous change. You walk out the door one thing and come in another. <laughs> that's a little extreme, but that's basically what they're saying. Quick, quick revolution, you know. It doesn't happen over billions of years. It could happen over 100 years. But I, I still know that the record of God's word back almost 6,000 years. That's the only record we have. And it's the inspired word. Now, whatever God created before Adam and Eve and before the creation that we live on, he can deal with that. And he will. One of these days, we're going to know it all. We do know that Satan, at a point, came and threw this earth into some sort of a chaotic condition. And evidently, God took and made what we have after the massive temper and destruction of Lucifer. Uh, this, again, is deep, and we won't go into it. But Adam and Eve was made. The animals were made. And you say, who in the world named the animals? Does anybody know who named them? Adam named them. My goodness, that was a job. Sure was. Sure was. But he was inspired of God. How long would it take for us to name every animal on the earth right now? It would take years. Maybe it took him years. I don't know. But I know one thing. He named them all. And many of the names still stand. Most of them. Maybe by interpretation there is a few changes. But most of those names are still evident. Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. And that's God's Word. And I see nothing there about evolution. Now, I do know that over the ages that things do happen and, and generations die off and new generations come forth. But again, that's the creative power. That is the, uh, uh, the work of what we speak of when we say begotten. When we use the term begotten, we use the term of offspring. Okay? Let's go on. Secondly, I believe that another office, a divine office of Jesus, is he is the upholder, the upholder of all things. Now, scientists say one of these days things are going to twist, turn, and that it's possible that the earth could shift enough to get enough of a degree off that anything could happen, another ice age, uh, who knows? But I, I just know in the depths of my heart that this inspired word written thousands of years ago depicts by the authority of God's word that this earth hangs here because God keeps it here. The sun stays there because God hung it there. The atmospheres stay in their relevance because God made them. Now, how He made them, I don't know. Scientists could be true. It could be true that, that things broke off and revolved and God did it that way. I don't know. All I know is God did it. The Bible says there's not books enough to hold the Bible and all the truths that we ought to know. There's not enough paper. There's not enough time to write it. If we were to talk about the creation itself, we'd have to write books for the rest of our lives if God were to reveal it just on the creation. All we have is a skimpy, a skimpy, very skimpy note. That's why we have to have a lot of faith. Are you with me? We have to have a lot of faith. Colossians 1.17. Brother Kiger, thank you. He is the upholder. That's one of his offices. He keeps the earth where it's at. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Yes. Thank you, brother. And by him all things consist. That means that where things are at this present time, He keeps them there. When we go out in the morning and the sun comes up, 
It's there because he keeps it there. All this. Hebrews 1 3. Thank you, Brother Morris. He is the upholder of everything. Who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image. Holding off. He's still the Word. Even though his surname is Jesus Christ, he's still the Word. And that Word, do you know when Jesus comes back and puts his foot on the Mount of Olives, his second coming, not the rapture now, but the actual second coming of Christ, when he literally comes and touches planet Earth, when the great battle takes place, the battle of Armageddon, I'm going to be preaching a, a message before too very long, and it's going to be involving the Euphrates River, the drying up of the Euphrates, which has a lot to do with that last battle. And there are some things happening right now that are scary, because I'll tell you, if, if I'm not going to be around for the, you know, through the duration, I'd like to go on back and get around the table a little and get some vittles. I'd like to have my new robe. I'd like, if it's, if it's going to be the way the Word says it, I want to go ahead to the judgment seat of Christ and get that taken care of. And then come back with Jesus and let Him do the fighting. I don't want to be here, part of the armies. How about you? Mm-mm. I want to be in robes of what? Riding horses. Spiritual horses, uh, you might say. And uh, I'm just going to stay just far enough behind him that as his mouth begins to depict, that's what the Bible says, what I'm getting at. The Bible says that in the word of his mouth, by the word of his mouth, he'll slay the armies of the earth. By the word of his mouth. Oh, that's tremendous power. No wonder when God speaks in our services, a message in tongues and interpretation, God blesses hearts. That's just a very small taste of the mighty truth of God. Hmm. Thirdly tonight, another office Jesus has, he has the right to forgive. Mark 2, 5 through 10. Now, should I go this far, uh, sister? You go ahead and read that scripture since you're there. Mark 2, verses 5 through 10. Thank you. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doeth this man thus speak blasphemies, who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reason within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he says to the sick of the palsy. Amen. Thank you, sister. That's a powerful scripture. But it's that you may know that the Son of God hath power on earth to forgive sin. He hath power to do it. Yes. Let me go this far tonight. I'm not one to just purposely bring up different ways of worship, but this is one thing that, and this is a scripture, and this is a study right here that's important to our church. And I believe Maybe I'm out of character here, but I don't believe. I, I don't believe that people that are saved and claim to be baptized in the Holy Spirit can go to another, another man and confess their sins and trust that man to take their sins and take them to God. I don't believe you can be saved and filled with the Spirit and still follow such a consequence because God's Word is too explicit. My Jesus already has the authority to forgive sins. You don't have to go to nobody else. You go to Christ. He's the one who saves. And I'll tell you, I think we need to stand our ground in this age. We need to do it with love. And we're going to get a lot of, we're going to get a lot of tongue lashing. Jimmy Swaggart's getting it. 
He gets on television. He preaches it like it is, mister. He doesn't code it over. He says it the way he believes it. And he may be getting a lot of flack right now, but one of these days, God's going to bless him for sticking to his guns. Because you can't take religion, smear a little bit of Holy Ghost over it, and say everything's all right. Now, you just can't do it. At least I don't think you can. I believe it's got to be according to God's Word. And this study alone, that's why I'm giving it is so that we as a church body will understand when we face these things. Hey, why don't we take our sins to a man? It's because Jesus Christ was given the authority to forgive the sins. No one else on earth has that authority. I, I just challenge anybody to show me in the scripture anybody has authority to do it because there is nobody else. Jesus Christ is your Savior and mine. And if you want forgiven of your sins, then you go to Jesus. Now, there are ministers of the gospel and men of the church that need to guide you to the Lord Jesus. That's what pastors are for, to lead you to the altar, to lead you to a place of repentance. But, mister, you don't repent to me. You repent to Christ. I don't think I'm too far out of line for injecting that. I think it's important that we see it. Luke 7, 48. Thank you, Brother Bob. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Yes, amen. Thy sins, there was no question about it. Well, I'll have to go and I'll have to have a conversation with the Father because I'll tell you, you're just, you've been a rough one. I'll tell you now, all the stuff you've been through, I just, everybody wants to stone you. Hey, lady, I just don't think I can help you. Is that the kind of Jesus we serve? No, sir. You come to him, my Bible says you come to him, and he'll no wise cast you away. Come whosoever will. That's what the Bible says. You may come. Praise the Lord for that. Aren't you glad? Fred Thompson wouldn't be in the pulpit today. If it had not been for the grace of God, and you wouldn't be here if it were not for his grace. Fourthly, another office of Jesus, an office that was given him by the Father. He's got the power, he's got an office that gives him the power of the raising of the bodies of men. Raising of physical bodies of men. In other words, I'm saying that Jesus Christ has the power over life and death. What does the Bible say when he went into earth? Bowels of the earth? I preached it over in Israel, didn't I, Brother Bill? What did I preach? Well, maybe I shouldn't ask you, but uh, he was probably gawking at the tomb. But I was, no, I didn't know he heard me, but uh, I preached on that. I preached on the fact of uh, what happened when I stood before the tomb and I preached there greatest event I think I've ever had in my life I'll never forget it I preached on the subject of what happened when Jesus went into the bowels of the earth what happened when he went inside the tomb nobody saw any more of him for three days the Bible says he went into hell and he faced the powers of the enemy and he won hallelujah <laughs> he won and he came out of the very doors of hell. And as the bars clamped shut behind him, he turned the key himself, for he had the power and the keys. The keys over death and over hell. Who had them? None other than Jesus Christ. Well, that's something to live for, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Isn't he a wonderful God? Man, I tell you, he's wonderful. Hey, this is a wonderful Lord we serve. Praise the Lord. John 6, verses 39, 40, and 54. Thank you, Brother Cruz. Good to have you tonight and your wife. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing. Hmm. but should raise it up again at the last day. 
and this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. There you are. I will raise him up at the last day. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Amen. Thank you, Brother Crew. In other words, there's a truth here we're trying to bring out, and that is that Jesus Christ not only raised the dead while, dead while he walked on earth and had that power, but he will have the power to raise all the dead in the first resurrection and in the resurrection that I, I want no part of. He has the power to do that. But these scriptures bring out a twofold truth. First of all, he has the power to raise bodies and put life back in them. <coughs> Secondly, you got to know him and you will have had to eat his flesh and drink his blood. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean you've got to become a part of him. When we come to the altar and take communion, we're not literally taking his blood and taking his body, but significantly we are. We are signifying that we are thanking the Lord for giving himself and shedding his blood, giving his body. And he said these words, if you haven't felt my pain, then you have no part with me. If you haven't really felt my pain, my blood being shed, you have no part with me. So there's a twofold truth there. John eleven twenty five. Thank you. He has the power of raising the bodies of men. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Yes, amen. Thank you very much. Though he were dead, yet shall he live. You say, Pastor, that speaks of salvation. It speaks of twofold truth. It speaks of death to sin and life in Christ and it speaks of death to the body and a resurrected body at the rapture there's a twofold truth there where Jesus Christ he has the power to cover our sins I talked with a person yesterday right in this church in counseling thank the Lord he covers sins I mean he covers them and to see a person transformed from a life of evil and to come into God. And the question was asked, Pastor, can you again renew my memory to Scripture that will help increase my faith on the fact that God has forgiven me of my sin and has thrown it into the sea of forgetfulness? And naturally, I took him to the Bible and I shared Scripture with him. And he left here feeling much better because Satan has been trying to tell him that those sins are not under the blood, that they're going to haunt him, they're going to come back at him. But my Bible tells me men may not forget them, but my God does forget them. John 10, 17 and 18. Thank you, Sister Paul. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Mm -hmm. I have power to lay it down, and go. I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Amen. Thank you very much. That shows the truth that not only is Christ, not only does Christ have the power and influence over our life for death and life, but he also is self-sufficient. He is self-sufficient. Nobody can take his life. He has the power over his own life. Isn't that something? He's got the literal power over his own life. Oh, that's, that's a real powerful God. Can you say amen? Hey, anybody can walk up to me and if they just one sitting, put a bullet to my brain. I'll collapse and die. Probably. Who knows? My wife says I'm full of rocks in the head and may do nothing. But most times it would. 
But Jesus Christ is not vulnerable. He allowed himself to go to the cross. He obeyed the Father and went. One more scripture, and then we're going to follow our last, our last point tonight. And you may wonder about this scripture, but I have a point to, that I want to bring across. Acts 9.34. Thank you, Brother Pat. Acts 9.34. And Peter said unto him, Anus, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. Amen. That's good scripture there. Now, who was talking here? Was Jesus talking here? Did you hear the scripture? Peter was talking. Peter was doing, Peter was doing the praying. Peter was doing the believing. But there's one point that I want to bring out. Because people will ask you, when you say Jesus has the power to raise bodies from the dead, people will say, well, I've seen, I've heard of people raising bodies from the dead. I've heard of that happening. But remember, when people are raised, if such, from the dead, by the prayers of men, it is done by a delegated power. Peter said, I raise you in the name of Jesus Christ. By Jesus Christ, rise up. Not in his power. Not in his sufficiency. And that's why I caution you. I am very cautious about a man who preaches and constantly says, I can do this for you. I can do that for you. I can transform this for you. Brother, they can't do it. Jesus does it. And unless Jesus gets glorified for it, that work will never go. There's a lot of people that will follow him. But that work will come to naught. Because Jesus Christ is the one who delegates the power. There are men that are being used in great miracles today. But the reason why they're being used is because Christ saw fit to delegate his power unto them so that they might be used. And that is the only way it can happen and will happen and can happen because Jesus said, greater things than these shall you do because I go unto my Father. All right. Fifthly and last. The last office that I have recorded in these notes, although if I were to really scour and push and take a lot of time, I could probably give you more, but these were the ones that really I felt were really, really important. This office, and it's a unique divine office, he is to be the judge of all men. I've talked about salvation, talked about raising the dead, I've talked about the sufficient Christ, the upholder, I've talked about the creator, I've talked about the sustainer and the savior, but now he also holds the office of not a judge. He is the judge the judge when we face the judgment bar we will face him do you believe that and no one else where do you get it pastor John 5 22 thank you sister Paul for the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. There you go. The Father judges no man, but he hath committed all judgment unto the Son. 2 Timothy 4.1. Thank you, Brother Fritz. Good to have you back, too, Brother. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Amen. Did you hear that? And I charge you, not only in God, but in the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge. Acts 17 and 31. Thank you, Sister Marty. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. I want you to read that again, Sister Marty. And Maybe they can turn that up just a little. Now, this scripture is more of a doctrinal scripture. 
and you've got to look at the scripture very closely to get the truth of it. But if you'll listen closely, you'll see that there's many truths involved in this verse of scripture. Read it nice and slow, my girl. Okay. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Jesus Christ. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Amen. Now see, the reference in that scripture is not given to Jesus Christ. It's speaking of God. It's speaking of a God who has given the authority as judge to Jesus. Do you understand what I'm getting at? So we get a double truth here. We get a double truth. We're getting scripture that's showing us by the holiness of the Holy Ghost, by the inspired word, that God himself has put his stamp of approval upon these offices in which Jesus Christ holds. Now, they could have written scripture all the scripture and said, Jesus Christ has this office. Jesus has Christ has that office. But God inspired them to write, God gave him the offices. And the approval of God is upon him. And he has that authority. That's a good scripture. Thank you, sister. And we have one last one. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. I want everybody to turn in their Bibles to this portion of scripture. We're going to close with this going to gather about the altar. You may ask, Pastor, are we going to be judged? Here we are sitting in church tonight, join the presence of the Lord. Are we going to be judged? What does the Bible say? He who will judge the quick and the dead. We'll be judged sure as living. For every time we come to church, for every chance we ever had to witness, for every word we've ever spoken, and that's what the Bible says. We're going to be judged for every single word we have ever said. We're going to be judged. Our actions, our attitudes. Pastor, what about our sins? If you're living in Jesus Christ and you're covered by his blood, there should be no sin in your life. If you did sin, you better get it under the blood and you better get it under quick. Because there, ain't, ain't, there isn't going to be any sin up there. So if you expect to get to the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to get there without sin. Did you hear me tonight, church? Because that judgment seat is to judge us for our rewards for what we have accomplished in this church, what we have accomplished in our homes, what we have accomplished on the streets under the name and under the authority of the Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's what we're going to be judged for. The Bible says our sin has been forgotten. It's in the sea of forgetfulness to be remembered no more against me. I cannot be judged for something that has been forgotten. But I'll tell you, it may be just almost as bad to have to go to heaven and have lost multitudes of rewards and have to sit out heaven in some far corner while multitudes of people in the same place that we're enjoying are in the midst of what's going on. You say, Pastor, is there going to be degrees in heaven of reward? There sure is. And there's plenty of scripture to prove that. I preached a sermon on it. How many remember it? Not long ago, a year ago or so. I preached on this. The rewards. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you sow a lot, you'll reap a lot. If you sow a little, you'll reap a little. And I'll tell you, I've heard people say, just so I slide under the gate, I just want to be like a rat. You ever see a rat get under a fence? Them things can just squeeze down until they're just paper thin. Brother, we may squeeze in, but that's an awful shaky way to go to heaven. Awful shaky way. Why not have everything? Do you understand what I'm getting at, people? Why not have everything? 
I just, I'm not a Billy Graham pastor. You're not expected to be. Well, he, look at the reward he's got. How can I compete with him? You don't compete with him. You hand out tracts on the street, and if you do it with all your heart, you'll get just as great a reward as he gets. What happened to the man that hired the people in the vineyard? Some of them had already worked hours in the vineyard, and he hired more. And the man ended up paying the ones that only worked three hours just as much as he paid those who had worked all day. They were grumbling and complaining. Jesus told them, or at least the Lord of the vineyard told them, these men came and gave all. They worked with their might. They're worth just as much as you are because you've been here eight hours and have only done as much work as they've done in three. So they get the whole day's salary. That's the kind of rewards Jesus is going to give out. Don't you try to depict yourself alongside of somebody that may be a pastor or, or uh, some great name. Oh, boy, Billy Graham, he's just going to be flooded. He'll be up in the front of the line. We'll never get close to him. I'd say that Billy Graham will be amongst some of the fine pastors that are pastoring 50 member churches all across this country and world. Billy Graham will be walking right with them side by side. Because he's doing it. And I say this, you may, I don't know whether you, uh, that's up to you, but I'll tell you, Billy Graham's a fine man. He's a good preacher. But if I do my best, <laughs> if I do, do my, my best in this pulpit, I expect that my reward will be just as great. I have every right to expect it. Go ahead and read, my sister. Read it with her, please. I mean, follow in your Bible. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his, of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall sh set the sheep on his on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed on my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me drink. Mm -hmm. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when we saw, when we saw thee a hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink, when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee, or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. There you go. Then shall I say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and you gave me no meat. Mm. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer unto them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of, of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Amen. Thank you, sister. I want us to stand and bow our heads just a moment.